Well, tenancy laws in Japan are very tenant oriented. So you can assume that a tenant is on a two year rolling lease, which is the standard in Japan. And you wouldn't be kicking them out just because you think you could get higher rent because, well, first off, it's it's not nice to do, but they do have a legal leg to stand on if they take you to court. Japanese tenants normally won't. Mm -hmm. But if it's a gaijin tenant in there, for example, or a, even a bored old Japanese dude with a lot of time on his hands, um, they might. Mm -hmm. So you're not you're not really allowed to raise the rent and you're not really allowed to not renew the lease. It's assumed that it's automatically renewed every two years unless the tenant wants to terminate it. Hi there, folks, and welcome or welcome back to Nippon Trading International's Japan Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Ziv Nakajima again, and this podcast is brought to you, among others, by Emil Gorgis of realestate.jp. He's a Tokyo real estate agent who specializes in serving international or mixed nationality families who are looking for the perfect family home. So Emil's an Australian, he's been living here in Japan for over two decades now, and for about half of that time he's been buying, selling, and managing real estate properties in Tokyo on behalf of his own family and a great many happy clients. And he also acts as a mortgage broker on behalf of his clients. So he's got dedicated loan officers in many of the Japanese mega banks. And if you're a regular listener of the podcast, you probably already know him from our JREP, the Japan Real Estate Experts panel sessions which means that you're already aware of the fact that the man is an absolute fountain of wisdom on all things related to real estate in Japan, and in particular to family homes, the greater Tokyo metropolitan area, and mortgages. And most importantly, he's incredibly generous with his time and advice, which he's more than happy to provide at no cost or commitment to anyone asking. So if you've been thinking about buying your home in Tokyo, but you've been sitting on the fence for a while, or you just wanna have a chat in English with a real expert, Drop him a line on sales at realestate.jp. Hit him up today and start exploring your options. All right, so for today's episode, we're back with the Akia Mart crew, Joey and Take. They've really enjoyed the uh, short deal analysis segment that we did in our previous chat. We'll link to that recording in this episode show notes, just in case you've missed it. And they've asked if we can have a longer session of pure investment property deal analysis. So look at the numbers, dig into them. And so we talked condo units versus buildings, which of the two should various types of buyers go for, which of the two would be more feasible for an investment loan, uh, and how those loans actually work, who can qualify for them and how. And then we, then we then talk about Japanese property listings, what data is included in them, and how reliable that data is. We also talk about what we do for clients as part of the property research and due diligence process. And then we go over our deal analysis spreadsheets and explain what those actually include, how yield is calculated. Oh, by the way, important point to uh, take note of, since we've recorded this conversation, a new legislation has been passed and that one now allows a realtor to charge a minimum of 330,000 yen per property purchase facilitation uh, or sale, even if the standard calculation, which is normally 3% plus 60,000 yen plus tax is actually below that amount, they can still charge that minimum amount of 330,000 yen. So that can, of course, increase purchase costs for properties on the cheaper side. So we cover that. And then we'll segue into a discussion of property management. How does it work in Japan? How much does it cost? And also, how much should investors be putting aside for maintenance, renovation, and vacancy expenses? We then, from that topic, move on to tenants, and we talk about how long average tenancies run for here normally uh, for various tenant profiles. And on the topic of yields again, we also talk about what we should factor in as far as appreciation and capital gains go. How income tax works for property investors, what can be claimed as a deduction to further reduce tax liabilities. And finally, a few last but super important topics. What kind of due diligence info is available and when during the purchase process is that information disclosed? Is it possible, for example, to remove existing tenants from properties purchased? Does it depend on the tenancy lease? Recommended age of properties for purchase and how long should investors be holding on to them before reselling? What sort of yields can we expect overall? How do those yields differ from short or medium stay rentals and all the way to long-term tenancies? 
And then finally, how do these short and medium term rentals actually work? as well as what types of insurance policies are available for each of them and which of these insurance policies should be purchased by investors. So super deep dive into all things related to deal analysis and investments in Japan. I want to say I hope you'll enjoy it, but I'm pretty confident that I know you definitely will. It's one of the best conversations we've had, I think, on the podcast. So enjoy it, and I'll see you again on the other side. All right. I heard the blue. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, yep. so um, investment deal analysis. Let me open up a couple of spreadsheets. Give me a sec. Very excited to see these spreadsheets. <laughs> okay, I'll send you the actual copies, but I just wanted to review them together first so that you'll know what you're looking at when you get them. Um, let me grab something from 2023 that would have both buildings and units on it. Give me a sec. Jerry's been making his own spreadsheets. I think they're... Let's, uh... I've been trying to. I based it off uh, some spreadsheet that a friend made. Uh, he was looking at American properties, but yeah, I've been trying to learn more, get a get a sense for the numbers. You know, people are throwing up ROI, cash on cash return, and, you know, cap rate. Those those type of things. Trying to figure out what they all mean. Why why we look at these things. Mm. Um. So while you look at it, yeah, we've yeah. Um, Joe and I have talked a little bit about: Do we go Akia? Do we go? Uh, investment condo and we kind of we've gotten advice on on two different directions i think the one being if we ever want to get a loan using a condo as leverage for a loan might be a, a effective strategy versus getting an akia that's a wooden structure that we might not be able to get collateral or or, or use as leverage have you heard of that before um well it's only Leverage in the sense that Japan will only. Are you talking about the loan in Japan? Yeah. In Japan, yeah. If we got a condo, it could be potentially used as collateral for our a loan mm -hmm. someday. Um, not as collateral. Japan doesn't do loans on collateral. What they do is loans on based on income. So if it's mm -hmm. an investment property and it's generating income, then that qualifies as something that they would consider compliant but not on the value. There's no borrowing on equity, leveraging collateral. They don't do that here. Got it. Yeah. Very interesting. So once you, once you generate a sufficient income stream of, uh, I think at least 3.5 million yen uh, taxable income per year, that's when they'll start considering you for a loan. And that income can come from any kind of sources as long as it's generated in Japan in Japanese yen. 3.5 million got it so that's when banks will start considering you for loans yeah okay that's the that's the number we got to hit joey <laughs> yeah and your <laughs> borrowing capacity plus. would be on average depending on the lender but on average seven times your annual income yeah we're looking so, at maybe yeah. the the we talked to emil about it shinsei something shinsei yep. loan he's mentioned 60 percent loan to value or something is what we could potentially look at as non-residents Oh, as non-residents, yeah, but then your terms wouldn't be nearly as attractive too, I think, right? Like the, oh, the interest rates, yeah. Yeah. So, Still yeah. better than the U.S. Still better than other Oh, yeah, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> but, um, uh, you, you are setting up a Japanese entity at some stage, right? Yep, we're in the process, in the process. right now. Yeah, it'll be a lot easier once you've got a Japanese entity that's making money in Japan and you're considered resident, I mean, the company is considered resident at least. Oh, could we... Do you think we could get a, a more favorable loan once we have income coming to after that about a year of after about a year of generating income in japan and if you've got a japanese ceo representative director in place then yes got it okay we need to get that ceo in place asap joey yeah i, I mean look it, it's all a factor hiring a ceo is a factor of how much money you're making and if you can afford it or not right so everything boils yeah. down to income eventually okay yeah Okay, so let me share my screen. Present now. Window. How can I do entire Excel? Okay, never mind. I'll start with this one. Okay, share. Okay, are we seeing that? Yes, we can. Perfect. Okay. Yep. Right. So, this is our internal sheet when we send it to customers we're not going to have the name of the agent and see here at the end we've got a link to the original listing um, so mm -hmm. 
a customer version of that will be a bit truncated, but basically, and this is an ID that we give it just for our internal references. And here is general information about the property um, address. Sometimes, you know, by now the listings will sometimes have a partial address, sometimes a full address, some info about the property. Yeah. And then up here, we put the price of the listing, mm -hmm. the gross rent amount that it generates per month. Mm -hmm. And um, I think she did that wrong. Let me look at another one. No, what have you done, lady? It, this would be right? like, for example, something you found on Rakumachi or another yes. similar website. Rakumachi or can be uh, one of the major. Uh, oh, here, here's a better example. Okay. So let me just. Sorry, my eyes are not what they used to be. Okay, so listing price, gross rental amount per month. Oh no, this is not this is not the tab I was looking at. Come back. Where did you go? Bloody hell! Um, and you believe those those gross rent values? You believe like face? You take them at face value when you see something. So if the property is ten, if the property is tenanted, then that's information that they have to give you. Um, okay. Sometimes they, you know, they make mistakes, and then when you'll contact them, they'll say, "Oh no, sorry, actually, it's it, it was lower than I put online." But usually, yes, that would be the gross rent if the property is tenanted. If the property is not tenanted, then they're just guessing what they think it might uh, generate. And in those cases, um, in those cases, I wouldn't trust them because they're always going to inflate that to make the return look better. Okay. Yeah. Good. I've yeah. seen that, and I'm wondering, like, is this really just a guess? Did they take the last rent? You, you never know, it seems like. Yeah. I mean, there's no substitute for actual rent research. If you're looking at a vacant property, you want to go online and see what similar properties are being advertised for in that area, yeah. similar distance to station, similar size, similar age of building, and so forth. Right, right. Yeah. And okay. based on that. Okay. Now, here's some big news for anyone interested in Akia, the abandoned vacant homes that are abundant all around Japan for very attractive purchase prices. Akia Mart, our latest sponsor, is a recently founded online search and discovery tool for Japanese real estate. Its user interface will be very familiar to users of Zillow or Redfin. The platform essentially scouts the internet for property listings, translates them into English, and displays prices in US dollars all in one place and with a dynamic map interface that makes browsing, finding, and shortlisting your favorite properties a piece of cake, which any of you have been struggling with the dozens, if not hundreds, of Japanese property websites that are available online and their very clunky interface will probably find a real blessing. They've got already over half a million listings on the platform and the database is expanding daily, ranging from abandoned rural homes to luxury urban properties. Akia Mart makes it easy to find your dream home in Japan, regardless of your budget. Now, while the platform is essentially free for use, here's an exclusive offer for listeners of the podcast. You can use the promo code NTI to receive $5 off Akia Mart Pro. The subscription will unlock a bunch of very attractive features for you, including unrestricted access to the entire nationwide property database and a whole range of filters, which will help power charge your search for that elusive perfect home and make it even easier. So hop over to akia-mart.com. That's A-K-I-Y-A-M-A-R-T, akia-mart.com, and kick off your search today. Is when... If, if it's owner change, tenanted, that's when you get more reliable rent data. Okay. Supposedly 100% reliable, yeah. Supposedly 100%. <laughs> yeah. Um, there, there's always room for error, but they're supposed to list it with the actual rent that it's generating. Yeah. I'm just, um, I need to share another one. Sorry. Give me a second. No problem. Do you provide that type of service if someone, like, do you go out of your way to find comparables like that if if it's a property that's not currently tenanted? Uh, we or definitely, most of our customers wouldn't buy vacant properties unless they're in super central locations and they're, we're pretty sure that we could um, quickly uh, okay. quickly populate it for them. But we would definitely, if they're buying vacant, we would definitely do rent research because, yeah, what the realtor says is what they are hoping to convince people with. It's not necessarily the real thing. Okay. But most people just want tenanted and... And yeah, I mean, people prefer to buy, investors prefer to buy turnkey generating income from day one rather than buy into building expenses and then wait a few months until they get their income and hope yeah. to, hoping that it'll be at the level that they hope, but who knows. Okay, 
So I just shared a different one. You're seeing that one where my cursor is moving? Yep. Yes. OK. So buy price, rent price, um, the management fee and the reserve funds contributions. Those are the two monthly building payments. Right? We put them all up here. Mm -hmm. And then down here. That's the, re just... that's the repair fund, sorry. Management fee, ACK fund yeah. is repair fund. OK. Yes. Uh, the direct Japanese translation is accumulated funds, but it's the, the equivalent of reserve funds or, or yeah, repair repair fund, whatever you want to call it. And management mm -hmm. fee is what you pay for management of the building. So the small stuff, the on-site manager, the gardening, the water and electricity in common areas, stuff like that. Yeah. Rent is month, month, that's goman, goman a month? Rent, rent is rate? approximately goman a month, yes. Okay, got it, got it. Okay. Here we just copy the listing price, and then down here, and um, that's the trickiest part, is we try to uh, calculate worst case purchase costs, what we think the purchase costs would be. Mm -hmm. um, and those vary depending on how expensive the property is. So we know from experience that if it's, so first of all, let's take 5% off that because that's our fee. So this is assuming um, and we'll take our fee, our management fee off here. So this is assuming the uh, buyer is purchased directly from the agent. We're not involved. He doesn't need us representing him for the purchase or for management, right? Mm -hmm. So the prices to purchase would vary um, anywhere between 10 to 15 percent. Yep. And we know from experience that something that's, um, let's call it over seven or eight million would probably be um, 13, 14%. And if it gets closer to 10 million, it'll go down to 13. And if you look at a building, it'll go down to around 10, right? Uh, anything that's, let's say, over 400,000 US or what? Okay, so lower purchase cost as the purchase price goes up is the general Correct. trend? Okay. Yes, because the um, there are some, like the, real, the realtor fee, starts with five percent until the property reach until the price reaches uh, two million yen and then it goes down slightly after that the uh, judicial scrivener needs to charge a fixed amount for his work regardless of how much the property costs and then um, taxes are based on official evaluations which are always a bit different to market price but yeah generally speaking purchase costs percentage wise are going to be lower as the property becomes more expensive right right and then we because these are um properties that we uh give to customers who have engaged our services so we know that they're paying us then we add our fee on top of that which is going to be depending on the price of the property three or four or five percent in this case let's call it five percent just for argument's sake so we put it 18 percent in total right got it okay and then that's the total to be paid uh, so yep. the property price plus the purchase cost and then monthly um this is a formula that we've calculated for um for mansion rooms it's a little bit pricier in case of a building but that's not a major a major factor because insurance is very cheap in japan in any case this is um, a monthly oh yeah sorry it says cost monthly and uh, um yeah could you just maybe speak a little bit about where like where the number came from a little bit more or first or of all are, are you hearing sauce? me because my mic just told me i lost it no we can hear you just we can hear you from that i'm on the right mic like is that just the fire insurance or i guess i'm curious what you pay as a condo owner um, so as a condo owner, you only need to insure the interior. Obviously, the building, uh, the owner union takes out the building insurance policy for the structure itself. And stuff that the insurance doesn't cover, they'll be paying out of the reserve funds if they need to. So you just need to worry about the interior. Um, that number is just based on our experience. Um, I wish I could tell you how the formula works, but that's that's like depreciation that's way over my pay grade and i mean actuaries and accountants have their own formulas but we know that um generally speaking for a five-year policy on a condo unit um we normally pay something like a thousand bucks for five years if it's a house it's somewhere between uh, sorry let's call it yen so a hundred thousand japanese yen for five years if it's a house, 200 to 250,000 for five years, depending on the size of the property. 
and if it's a building like four to five uh, four hundred to five hundred thousand so we just we just divide it by that right okay Got yeah it. it's not right, it's, it's not a easy, magic though. formula but i mean I can send you some samples of insurance policies for various types of properties so that you'll see how it works out. Um, it's That's never going to be a, a really good calculation, uh, like a magic formula that, that's always correct. So it's just assumed. Yeah. But again, insurance is, uh, it's kind of like purchase costs are assumed because this, for example, we're not going to know how much the uh, purchase tax and registration fee is going to be before we get a lot closer to settlement. So when we're evaluating deals, we call it worst case purchase costs, worst case insurance or assumed insurance. And we just, we, we get real numbers as we get closer to settlement. But we try to evaluate the deals on a worst case scenario so that it only gets better by settlement. And then, you know, if the numbers work in worst case scenario, they'll definitely work in real life, right? Yeah. And then down here, we've got property management, which is, Kind of the average, um, most cases, it's going to be 5% plus tax. So that's 5.5 um, times the rent price. Okay. And that is something um, you use, a, you outsource that, right? That's not something NTI handles? Yes. Yes. Okay. We outsource that. Um, there are some areas in Japan um, and some scenarios where it's going to be a bit more or a bit less. So in Shikoku, for example, because maybe there's just, I don't I'm not sure why but maybe just because there's a handful of property managers in the main cities in Shikoku they charge eight or ten percent and uh, in Tokyo Osaka Fukuoka places where there's a bunch of them they'll offer four percent and you know if we've worked with them for a while and we got a bunch of properties under manager they'll give us three percent but again the the industry average the industry norm it's not regulated like real fees are so people can offer lower or higher prices, but the industry standard is 5%. And so I, I've never been in this position myself, so uh, forgive the noob question, but what, what service do they actually provide? Like if there's a long-term tenant, like I'm just curious what they actually, what the property manager actually does. So they handle anything related to the tenant. They are the ones receiving complaints or maintenance requests or requests for anything else from the tenant. They're the ones collecting the rental income and chasing it up if it's not paid and then depositing it to your account. Okay. Yep. And when the property, property becomes, management, that's probably, that, uh, let's call it tenant management, right? Tenant management. So there's a building management company uh, that the owner union hires and they're the ones who are charging those fees, the building fees. But that's not your choice, right? You don't get to appoint the building management company. The owner union has that in place already. Right. The property manager, you get to appoint yourself, or we do on behalf of our customers. Got it. And um, when the property becomes vacant, this is not something that I can include here because it's speculative. I don't know when the property will be vacant, how often it's going to happen. Could happen a month after purchase or could happen 10 years after purchase. But when a property becomes vacant, the property manager charge um, the norm. So their fee is one month for placing a new tenant, one month of gross rental income. Um, but they'll often it'll often boil down to two months because they'll be sharing the listing with other property managers to try to get a tenant quicker, in which case that property manager also needs to get a month. So you can safely assume that when a property becomes vacant, it's going to cost you two, at least two months of gross rental income to repopulate it, aside from the um, uh, renovation or repairs, or any, I mean, and just in property manager fees. Um, we charge half a month regardless. So one or two months, let's call it two months to the property manager if they're working through nti half a month to nti and in cases where it's particularly difficult to populate a property for whatever reason let's say it's uh, middle of the winter in sapporo and people don't move around much or it's near a university campus and the tenant moves out mid mid uh, term and and it's diff more challenging to find or there's a lot of for for some reason the area became um extra popular there's a bunch of new construction buildings and then the older unit owners are struggling to find tenants because everybody wants a place in the new building. So in cases where it's particularly difficult, the property manager will suggest to pay extra for various stuff. So either offer extra incentive to other property managers or offer extra incentive to tenants like first month free rent or owner will pay, will participate in your move-in fees or stuff like that. So 
in very difficult cases, it could, could come to three, four, or five months to place a new okay. tenant. Okay, but all things being equal, it would, should usually not be more than two months. Got it. Okay, but that's not on the spreadsheet. Again, same as um, vacancy expenses, maintenance expenses. That's all stuff that we just can't. I mean, I can give people rough, rough statistics if they've got a larger portfolio that they've been holding over time. Then I can tell them that they should factor in roughly ten percent of the gross rental income and annual vacancy and maintenance expenses. But I'm not going to do that for somebody who's just buying one or two units and this is their first ones because statistics get horribly skewed in those cases. Now, if you've attended any of our recent JREP Summit events in Tokyo, you've probably heard our sponsor, Robert Miller from Innovatious.com. He's been in web solutions here in Japan for the past 25 years, and he's also an active investor in Japanese real estate property, as well as global online property, which is his specialty and what his company Innovatious is all about. They offer a full suite of website services for entrepreneurs and small business owners, including all aspects of web design and management, backup and updates, content formatting and editing, proactive maintenance and error fixing, you name it, with a strong focus on SEO excellence, which is what gets you those hardcore top of the list search engine rankings. But there is a difference. Innovatious works off a simple, all-inclusive monthly subscription model, as opposed to the typical outdated and confusing per project model. So you never have to wonder how much any request for any work to be done on your website might cost. It's always $297 per month period. And if that's not enough, if you mentioned that you've heard of their services on the Japan Real Estate Podcast, you'll also get 10% off this monthly price for life. Also, and equally important, if not more, you can try out Innovatious for just one month, then switch them off on again later if you wish and so forth. There are no minimum subscription terms. Now, if you're a small business owner, managing and growing a website is super distracting and time consuming, right? That's exactly where Innovatious comes in. Robert's team takes care of all of that for you so that you can focus on what you do best. So feel free to email Rob at robert at innovatious.com. That's I-N-N-O-V-A-C-I-O-U-S dot com. And his team will conduct a full SEO and website audit on your site, reveal anything that you should address to lift your website's appeal and visitor numbers and provide you with an easy to read detailed report with your own branding so that you can make some informed decisions on your online strategy and watch your business grow as you implement it. So once more, Robert at innovatious.com, drop him a line and get your website reviewed today. Do you feel that Japanese tenant, like on average, Japanese tenants do stay in place for a long time? Um, in our experience, um, singles or couples tend to stay in place four to five years. So let's call it four and a half on average. Um, families are eight to 10 years. Um, but again, that's statistics. We've got tenants in place for 20 plus years and a yeah. lot of people that have moved out a year into their lease. So on an average portfolio that's been held for an extended amount of time, I can say four to five years for singles and couples and eight to 10 years for families. Interesting. And then down here is the building fees, which is just a summary of those two up here. And then if they're working through NTI, we charge a minimum of um, 2,800 yen plus tax, so 3080. So maybe uh, you're gonna cover this later, but like on average, how would you advise a client? I know rent prices typically are going down versus up. Um, you advise like a certain, building in a certain percentage over a five-year plan or i guess that's only really between tenants right or do tenants do you ever raise prices for tenants once they've started um, renting we haven't because japan's economy has been stuck in the doldrums for too long um i mean property prices are going up cost of living is going up but salaries haven't so we have to charge what the market charges and we have been i mean in very very central locations in big city we've been able to maybe raise the rent by like 2000 yen between tenants but nothing beyond that and in most cases it's going to stay the same or even decline got it i guess on the decline like what would you expect over you know a couple year span is it like a 10 percent decline is expected or is it more than that um really depends on the area and on how old the building is that's one of the reasons that we advise the people to 
when they purchase a mansion, a condo unit, to purchase it for um, to purchase it 30 years or younger, because as it gets closer to 40 years is when building fees start going up more rapidly and rent mm -hmm. starts declining more rapidly because the building is less attractive to tenants. And that's when you want to consider as it approaches 40 years is when you want to consider reselling it. So we want people to at least have six, seven, eight years of income before they start considering reselling, which is why we aim towards 30 years and younger. If they can live with a lower yield, maybe 20 years and younger is the best. That will definitely hold the rent, uh, hold the income a lot better. And if it's a concrete apartment building, do you still get the depreciation benefits uh, for taxes? Or yeah, is that yeah, you, you get more depreciation benefits because it's um, the depreciation cycle is 47 years as opposed to 23 years on wooden structures. Got it. Um, but as to how that, I mean, I know that accountants have at least two ways in which they can calculate depreciation and they choose the more profitable one or the, the one that offers more tax benefits. But that's again, that's over my pay grade. I wouldn't know how they calculate that. Got it. Just a, a, a kind of brainstorm sesh, uh, question. Peop, uh, investors that come to you, are they already paying income tax in Japan or are many of them kickstarting off sort of like a, a, the tax pro, tax taxation in Japan when they invest? Um, so expats who live in Japan, which are probably about 20, 30% of our clientele are already paying income tax um, to one degree or another and not probably not on property, but from their salary or from their business, whatever the case may be. And anyone who's coming in from overseas, if they don't own anything in Japan yet, that's going to be the first time that they're paying income tax in Japan yet. Right. Mm. But there's a, a certain threshold they need to make before you have to report income tax. Is that right? Yes, 485,000 yen and net taxable income okay. uh, annually. So if you're owning one or two of these smaller units that are generating, see here, one of them would generate less than that. Mm -hmm. And even two of them wouldn't put you over the threshold because you're going to be claiming all of your purchase costs and carrying them forward uh, for three years right. as an individual or for five or six years if you purchase as a company. So if you're owning two of these smaller units, let's say up to two of these smaller units, you're probably going to be tax free. In in Japan, you'd still have to, you know, declare it and pay it in your country of uh, origin. But in Japan, mm -hmm. you'd be tax free. Got it. Right. And that's then, that's what I was thinking of as renovations as like a tax deduction. Everything um, is a tax deduction. And if you're purchasing under a company name, um, you pay more to an accountant for um, annual uh, bookkeeping and tax filing, but you can claim a lot more. So the bigger your portfolio is, the more sense it makes to buy under a company name. And also, again, you can carry your purchase costs and any other uh, deductions you can carry for five or six years as opposed to three years as an individual. Got it. Um, and then based on that, we factor the um, cost of the property, uh, sorry, the, um, the annual income of the property. So the net annual income divided by the property price that gives us our annual yield, right? And the term of return, in this case, it's immediately, it's going to be like 33 years to get your money back, but we normally wouldn't sell anything at 3%. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to find out how long the lease for the current tenant is? You know, one of the things we'd like to do is is ideally renovate or find a find an untenanted spot, renovate, and then try to get a higher rent price. Is there any uh, strategy to either get a tenant out or play that timing a little bit? Well, tenancy laws in Japan are very tenant oriented. So you can assume that a tenant is on a two year rolling lease, which is the standard in Japan. And you wouldn't be kicking them out just because you think you could get higher rent because, well, first off, it's it's not nice to do, but they do have a legal leg to stand on if they take you to court. Japanese tenants normally won't. Mm -hmm. But if it's a gaijin tenant in there, for example, or even a bored old Japanese dude with a lot of time on his hands, um, they might. Mm -hmm. So you're not, you're not really allowed to raise the rent and you're not really allowed to not renew the lease. It's assumed that it's automatically renewed every two years unless the tenant wants to terminate it. Wow. Okay. Did you... Um, if you do want... If you are in a case where you really want somebody to move out, obviously sometimes it happens because, you know, the owner wants to use the unit themselves or yep. they really want to get somebody else in there for whatever reason, then you would be offering the tenant... Um, 
between six to 12 months rent in compensation because that's what it costs them to relocate. Right? Understood. Well, years free rent, pretty, pretty good deal for tenants in Japan. <laughs> yeah, they don't see it that way because for them, the path of least resistance, like they don't want to change their living conditions under any circumstance. They're not looking for the money, they're looking for things to stay the same. So it's mm -hmm. even though they're making a year's worth of free rent and it might just cost them six months of rent to move into a new place, um, they don't see it as a good deal. So mm -hmm. they want to stay where they are until they die kind of thing. What did um sorry the uh, uh the TOR acronym uh down like the um time to get a full return back what what did you call that I'm just keep... term of return I, I don't I just made it up term of sorry. return okay you made it up yeah. <laughs> cool I just wanted to know what it, uh, know what the the letters stood for yeah I mean that, that's a number that tends to scare some people but the way to think of it is not in 33 years I'm going to get my capital back the way to think of it is okay I'm making three percent a year I'm going to hold the property for seven years let's say so I'm going to make 21 percent and then if I sell it at the same price or close to it then that's the profit that I've made over that time right what's this the breakdown of people that investors that come um, that have financing in in place or or secure financing versus cash buyers that in, in your that that come to you in your experience we serve primarily cash buyers we have two customers one that has looked into a mortgage in the past and couldn't get it and one that's looking into it now after he's established a company in japan and been generating income for a few years and now we're looking into opening a bank account and applying uh, for a loan for him um oh sorry he he sourced a loan himself from shinsei investment and finance which is a subsidiary of shinsei bank Mm -hmm. probably the same one that you've been talking to um yeah, yeah. but we haven't had anyone pull the trigger on that yet so i don't really have any experience so our clients cash to date buyers. have been cash buyers yeah got it uh ziv you had mentioned I, it sounds like with these condos age of building is probably one of the big factors to look at you can you remind me like so what would you recommend if we were to buy something right now and we wanted to hold on to it for 10 years are we looking at something that's 20 years old at, at most or what would you recommend to your clients well, I would recommend to hold it until it gets to around 36, 37 years old. So if you want to hold it for okay. 10 years, aim for something that's 25, 26 mm -hmm. years old on purchase. Okay. And at, at which point, once we hit that 36, 37 years old, we we sell it? You'd recommend we sell yes. it? or Yes. Okay. You would resell it because um, that's when the... Inv I mean, these are primarily investment properties. Obviously, somebody mm -hmm. who's buying a 25 square meter um, apartment... Mm -hmm. Oops, sorry. Mike again. Don't feel like that. Blue Yeti mic? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. So yep. obviously somebody who can afford to uh, buy this property is never going to live in a 25 square meter room, right? Yeah. And um, so this is primarily an investment. And likewise, the tenants who are living in them in the vast majority of cases are not, never going to be able to afford to buy them in, in Japan. That's just the mentality mm -hmm. of people who live in these units. So these are going to be priced based strictly on the rental yield that they get and as building fees get higher and rent uh, gets lower investors will look at that and say well that's not worth nine and a half million yen anymore because i'm only going to get three percent off it i want to buy it for six and a half million so mm -hmm. when it gets to 36 37 as it approaches 40 years of age you want to resell it before it loses too much value okay got it what sort of so you mentioned the three percent cap rate not worth it um what you might have mentioned this at the start of the conversation but like eight percent when when do you sort of think it's a good like what's the what's the lower threshold and i guess eight, and what's the upper threshold eight percent would be nice it's very difficult to get in japan these days it was it was definitely there even 10 11 12 percent when we started 12 years ago these days if we get six six and a half we're pretty happy Okay. And most of our customers would be okay, um, obviously, depending on location, but most of them would be okay with four and a half, five percent. So this is a more typical property that we'd normally sell to, to customers, right? So relatively central location in Fukuoka City, price is a lot lower, uh, rent price is still 40,000 yen, so getting close to 50 yen. If you look at the age of the property, built 1994, so still under that 30-year mark. Um, yeah that or just on that 30 year mark this is a typical property that we'd normally be sourcing for customers this, this one looks good yeah 
So how often, you know, Jerry and I have been looking at uh, Minpaku and, and how to maybe even looking at apartments. And I know it's very, very rare to find a apartment building, maybe especially in Fukuoka that allows for Minpaku or Airbnb. I'm curious, have you dealt with uh, or made a transaction for a Minpaku condo or apartment in Fukuoka, Fukuoka or anywhere before? Not yet. We probably will very soon because a lot of people are asking about that, but not mm -hmm. yet. We have a few apartments that people are renting out on a monthly basis as opposed to a long-term lease, but not mm -hmm. uh, not straight out main pack, no. Um, okay. I, I've got another meeting in 12 minutes, so I just want to no go problem. over the, uh, yeah. the building spreadsheet before that. Okay, Give perfect. We interrupt this broadcast to tell you about Tokyo Family Stays. They're a short-term rentals company in Tokyo and they offer a home away from home experience, which is just perfect for remote working, quarantining, if that's still a thing, or if you just need somewhere quiet to get away from the world. They offer a variety of options for families, corporate relocations, or even if you're simply transitioning between homes in Tokyo. The properties are super comfortable, tastefully furnished, fully equipped with all amenities, and they accommodate up to 10 people. So really the only thing you'll need to bring with you is your toothbrush and maybe a change of clothes. They come with fast unlimited wireless internet, dedicated workspaces, and fully equipped kitchens, and they're just a delight to stay in. Fantastic alternative to Japanese business hotels, which if you've ever stayed in one, you probably know they're tiny, they're noisy, fine for a night or two if you're on your own, but longer term or with a family, you'll probably feel you're in a jail cell very quickly in a Japanese business hotel. So if you want to give yourself a sense of space and freedom by renting a real home, with comfortable Western beds, including all the necessities like baby bedding, children's toys, high chairs, etc. You definitely want to reach out to Tokyo Family Stays. They've been at it for over a decade. They're a fully licensed Minpaku or short-term stay operator. And as a special bonus for our viewers and listeners, they're also throwing in a breakfast basket upon arrival for anyone who books and mentions the Japan Real Estate Podcast or NTI. And not only for guests, if you're a property owner, you've got an investment property that you want to tweak for higher profit, or a holiday home that you want to rent out when you're not using it via short-term stays, drop them a line today, see how they can help you maximize your property's income. And again, as a special bonus to our viewers and listeners, they're also offering a free audit of your existing short-term stay listings without any obligation whatsoever. So feel free to reach out to them at tokyofamilystays.com. Well worth a visit. And again, if you're in the market for a family home in or around the Tokyo metropolitan area, Emil's your man. Don't be shy to reach out to him as well at sales at realestate.jp. And now back to the podcast. Okay, so these are buildings. Um, for this specific client, there are buildings in Osaka, but I mean, the same kind of thing applies anyway. Mm -hmm. um, the information is obviously different. You, you want to tell them how many units are in the building, what's the size of the structure, size of the land, stuff that you don't really think about with a condo unit, how many units in the building. Up here, the listing price is the same. The gross rent per month is the total amount of rent that you get from all units per month. Mm -hmm. But here, because there are no building fees, we factor in other things that somebody who mm -hmm. owns an entire building needs to think about. Now, these would normally be... Actually, let me share something better than that let me share a live one that we have all of the data for um after settlement uh, all right building for 250k i like that they do exist yes um let me show you this one so again stop sharing and share jerry should we buy a building oh so i'll just I was yeah. just thinking of Osaka. The, the, that one looks good. Should we okay. buy a building? So yeah. Here's a better populated. So after settlement, we have all of the information, all of the financials, except maybe purchase tax, because that comes in anywhere between six to 24 months after the purchase. But this building was purchased for 55 million yen. The gross rent amount is this. And here, what we put in is the price that it, the owner needs to pay for maintaining the building every month. Again, it's not related to renovations or anything big, just like the monthly expenses. So in this case, it provides internet to the tenants. There's a cleaning fee of the common areas. Once a year, you need to do your fire equipment maintenance and exterior pressure yeah. cleaning, whatever. So that's all information that we're going to get as we get closer to settlement. We add up all the annuals and the monthlies, divide, uh, annuals divided by 12, add up the monthlies and we get to that, right? Did you get that from like the previous owner of the building or just 
pieced it together? Some of it was together? in place. Uh, some of it we got new estimates for. Um, but that's not going to be available when you're looking at listings. That's stuff that will only become evident closer to settlement, okay. which is why okay. the, the previous sheet that I showed you had nothing here, right? Mm -hmm. Got it. But I mean, if you look at that compared to the gross rental income, that's usually not going to be beyond 10, 15%. So you can kind of safely assume, let's say worst case, 20% off the gross rental income. Okay. And then most of the other stuff is kind of similar. It looks a bit different here because again, we've got accurate costs, but you can see here that as I was saying before, the total purchase costs ended up being 10.30%, which is usually going to be the case somewhere between 10 to 11% for buildings or nine to 11% for buildings. Insurance is a bit different, but we here we actually got actual numbers, right? So we know what the policy was for five years. We divided it monthly. We also added landlord insurance, which is another type of insurance uh, that you want to get. So the earthquake and fire insurance um, protects you from anything that happens to the unit. The landlord insurance covers you in case of a death in the property, right? So there's special cleaning required. You're going to have to report that the property has had a death in it, which is going to reduce your rental income for at least a couple of years. So landlord insurance or death insurance as we call it uh, here at nti is something that you want to get when you've got tenants okay. in a property right um it's not that expensive it's usually less than five thousand yen a year per unit and it covers you for and um, we might get slightly better terms because we work with the same insurance company and we give them a lot of business so uh, i think in most cases it's going to cost a little bit more maybe seven eight thousand yen a year and it's going to cover you for um, up to half a million yen of expenses on the upon case of death. And then the most important part, a year or two of um, reduced or non-existent rental income. Right. So for 8,000 uh, 8, yen a year, you definitely want to get that. Okay. Yeah, 8, rent yen. Yen. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, eight thousand yen per per yeah, tenant yeah. per unit. Yeah, a per year. tenant per year. Okay, got it. Yeah. Um, rent management is the same, five percent. Uh, monthly fees, property tax is the same. Um, our fees, our minimum is uh, three thousand and eighty yen if we're managing a single low income property. But if it gets to a level where it becomes more than that, basically our monthly management fee is two percent, two percent plus tax, so zero point twenty two. Is that sorry that includes the the what we spoke about before the tenant the the outsourced tenant management service or is rent management is here that's the property management. management okay yeah that's the five percent that they charge and if nti orchestrates everything you, that's your fee got it if nti manages the property on the owner's behalf um beyond a certain point let's uh, i think it works out to be about 100 or 120 thousand yen in gross rental income per month um, then instead of charging our minimum, we just charge 2% 2, uh, 2 plus tax. Okay. That's NTI's fee. The purchase fee that we charge is up here. Yep. I see. That's it. And then same same kind of calculation, gross yield, net pre-tax, net monthly, net annually, and then... Ooh, 18 and years, payback, pretty good. Yeah, but again, you'd sell it. This Before is a wooden that. structure, so you would want to sell mm -hmm. it as it approaches 30 years, not 40 years. So wooden structures, we recommend buying 20 years and younger and reselling at about 30 years and younger. And so concrete, that's, sorry, go ahead. So, so that's interesting. I thought part of the reason for, for wanting to sell sooner was because uh you know eventually the the a, comp a development company that wants the land starts renting out units and then you're not going to be able to at, at a certain point you're not going to be able to get the full value back on your property but if you own the whole building um what's the reasoning for wanting to sell after after 20 years 30 years because your maintenance expenses get higher it's a wooden structure and once it hits 30 oh, okay. years maintenance expenses start becoming much higher okay there's no i mean there's no building fees you're going to have to put aside the portion of your rent to to pay for that but it's the same sort of same sort of calculation okay i see oh, okay and that was the same for the condo as well that the, the management yeah. fees keep going up so i was mixing it up with the if the building gets torn down 
fear as well. Yeah, I mean, that usually happens when they start approaching 45, 50 years of age. It could be a factor, but we would recommend selling them before that in any case. Right, right, right. And also, bear in mind that you're selling them on the Japanese market to Japanese buyers in the vast majority of cases. And most of these buyers are either not aware or not able to have other alternative investments overseas. So they'll take much lower yields than a foreign investor would. So they'd still give you a good price for the property, even as it gets older. Mm -hmm. I see. Guidings know that they can get, I don't know, five, six percent in their backyard. So they're not going to buy anything for less than that. But the Japanese investors will definitely buy for three, four, four and a half percent. Got it. Just super helpful. There's a lot of uh, never thought about owning a building quite yet. But if we do get to that stage, this is, uh, yeah, the death insurance and some of these things are, are pretty unusual that we wouldn't see here in, in the yeah. state. So interesting. Yeah, we, so I'll send you I'll send you sample uh, everything that I've just showed you I'll send you samples of now that you've got a rough idea of what you're looking at then you'll be able to play with the numbers and see what happens when you discount the purchase price if the rate, rent goes higher rent goes lower it'll mm -hmm. all reflect down here in the in the bottom yield so but mm -hmm. at least you'll know what numbers you're playing with one one thing is if I see on a lot of these investment condo listings that there's like a security guard that man patrols, you know, at, at what stage do you recommend or have you dealt with a building where you have to hire a security guard or, or a patrol? Yeah, manager um, patrols, I see. Uh, our customers would not, because they most of them can't get financing in Japan, they wouldn't buy anything over a million US, say because they're cash buyers so they're not going to be buying buildings that would require that um if you're buying a unit in a condo block then the owner union would decide based on the size of the building whether that's required or not i mean you can vote on it but that that's usually already going to be in place when you purchase okay understood thank you this is uh super helpful my pleasure i got another meeting in two minutes i'm sorry okay. i'll have i'll have to jump okay. off all right i'll all send right? you this recording thanks Ev. really appreciate Perfect. it Perfect. thanks for your time thanks, Talk soon. bye bye all right, so as promised, nice, very deep dive there on all topics related to property investment here in Japan. I know we've discussed many of these here on the podcast in the past, but I think it's quite handy to have a lot of this information collated into a single episode. At the very least, it hopefully saves you from having to scroll through hundreds and hundreds of episode titles just to find the information you're looking for, at least on the investment front. Now, before we go, we're also, as always, going to tell you and also link to our other sponsor's website. That's Hiroshi Shimizu, immigration lawyer and administrative scrivener. If you're thinking about moving here on a more permanent basis, or you're already in Japan on some sort of a temporary visa, and you want to switch to a longer term or permanent one, or if you're considering setting up a local company or a branch office of a foreign company, and you've got any sort of business or visa-related inquiries, or even if you just want to find out what your options are on any of these topics, feel free to contact Hiroshi Shimizu. You can find him at japanimmigrationexperts.com and he can help you set up a company, apply for any kind of visa, or just provide you with the best advice and extremely affordable consultation related to these topics. And he's already done that for many of our listeners. So feel free to reach out to him. Again, that's japanimmigrationexperts.com and you'll be well on your way. And that's it from us for today, folks. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Japan Real Estate Podcast. Do share it with your networks and please let us know what you think. So leave us a short rating or review on the iTunes store, on Spotify, or just drop us a line in the comment section of wherever you might have found this episode. We love hearing from you. Hope to have you with us again next time. And until then, have a great day or night ahead. Yoroshiku! Yoroshiku!